Good evening and welcome to today's Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with AARP Arizona. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence and nearly 38 million members across the nation and approximately 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. In the month of July, we will lean into AARP's return to in-person local events, volunteering and AARP rewards, and amplify the call to action for the 50 plus community to deepen connections. AARP has focused on the important work of being a wise friend and fierce defender for people 50 plus during the pandemic, demonstrating our commitment to their good health and financial security. As we face another summer with pandemic concerns and record inflation, the health and wealth communications continue to be important. Though so, too, does connecting with others in the name of health and happiness. We will meet this moment by offering flexibility, returning to free in-person events in local communities, as well as providing virtual experiences where people 50 plus can make these connections. To learn something new, to have some fun, and to, to discover new interest, please visit us at www.aarp.org backslash local or www.aarp.org backslash az. Thank you for attending tonight's event. Enjoy. Well, hello and good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am so happy that you are able to be here. And, you know, so as you're wondering what's going to happen, well, you know, let's talk a little bit about what's going on today. Today is July 14th, and today is Ted DeGrazia's birthday. Now, many people consider him to be kind of Arizona's war hall. We'll talk about him a little bit later on in the show, but happy birthday, Ted. Um, it is also National Tape Measure Day, and that is because back in 1868, the patent was issued for improvements in tape measures. That meaning suddenly now there was a retractable tape measure which forever changed how we would all marry, measure things longer than a foot or a yard. It is also Shark Awareness Week. Now from Mako to Basking, from Great White to Hammerhead, from Nurse to Tiger, Sharks roam our oceans and in some cases, freshwater rivers all over the globe. Now sharks do play a essential role in keeping waterways healthy and productive not just themes for horror movies um it is also national mac and cheese day so you know i can remember making mac and cheese with my grandmother doing the whole fancy bechamel and adding in the cheese and everything else so you know regardless of whether you're eating it or making it today is a great day to have a little bit of mac and cheese. Maybe you even dump it, dump it out of a box. It is also International Nude Day. So, you know, some people call those air baths. Probably one of the most famous naturalists would have been Benjamin Franklin that said he was known to take a air bath in front of his window, quite often letting the air circulate around through his birthday suit. Now, whether you decide to go to Shangri-La up north or Mira Vista, you can go celebrate with other nudists. National Nude Day. It is also International Non-Binary Day. 
because this day is really meant for raising awareness that we all deserve the space to be our true or authentic selves. So there is a lot going on as well as National Bastille Day. So the National Day of France, which is celebrated every from July 14th, it is the National Day and really commemorates storming of the Bastille back in 1789, which was a major event in the French Revolution. What can you expect from tonight's show? Well, you know, we've got a little bit of trivia coming up. We always have some little Arizona, as well as some music history. Now we've got From the Vault, as well as a beverage, and always a special guest. Now, if this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore, and... I moved here about 22 years ago. I was working in Brooklyn in a beautiful Carnegie building and decided that I had had one too many winners, like many of you, decided that I would trade all that snow and slush in for some sunshine. And so I moved from that library to a little library in South Phoenix. And now it's in some really fancy digs by Richard and Bauer pretty much right there on 7th Avenue and Buckeye. Now, when we moved to Arizona, we probably moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that was oh so many tones of beige. I'm happy to say now it is a very more simplified two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. Now, we have friends that call our house the Unmuseum because, I mean, there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile with matching appliances. And my bookshelves full of all kinds of knickknacks and fun things. Now, as soon as we got here, all I kept hearing about was there was no history. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, whether it was on foot, on bike, in a car, I came across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And then there's that post-war boom that I think had a lot to do with making the Arizona the Elnow in Love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passing through or somewhere else, they were moving here in huge numbers, in some cases, looking for a whole new way of life, which they got. Now, I'm also called the Hip Historian, and that is because I get to have fun with Arizona history. Now, if any of you were watching Good Morning Arizona last week, you saw me on there talking a little bit about some Arizona history. Now, also coming up on Saturday, July 16th at 10 a.m. That's right, 10 a.m. Um, I'm going to be down in Chandler at the Public Library downtown talking about Disney in Arizona. So that's going to be a fun program. Um, later this month, we are going to be doing dinner and seance down in Bisbee at the Greenway House. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I think I may even have some friends going down. So that should be a hoot. Now, I see some of you already found the chat. Feel free to reach out to me through there. You can also reach out to me through Facebook, Instagram, email, or even through my website. And, you know, because I love hearing from you. In fact, that's actually where I find most of my best stuff is by chatting with you all. And now, you know, we come to that moment where we have pinged PJ, who is my cocktail advisor, who has been creating a cocktail for over 100 shows that we've done. And so today, because of National International Nude Day, he decided that we should imbibe a cocktail called Naked and Famous. And so I see Bob has already made my cocktail for me. So here you go. In case you wonder, I wonder what could be in a Naked and Famous. Let's take a look. Oh, and I forgot when I went to go pick this up from PJ, he was doing Phoenix Knife Night, Knife Fight, Phoenix Knife Fight, which was a culinary and cocktail competition out in Chandler in its third year. It looked like a lot of fun. It was a big crowd. And so I definitely will have to check that out next year. 
Now, in a Nick and Famous, we have a little bit of Mezcal, Chartreuse, Aperol, and Lime Juice. Ooh, that's a little spicy. Wasn't expecting that. All right. Now, now it, we're going to talk about Little Arizona because, you know, I talk about being from New York, but I really grew up in a small town in the Midwest. And today we're going to talk about a town called Rio Rico, which is in Santa Cruz, has a population just under 20,000, was established in 1969. Now, just because it was created so recently, well, fairly recently compared to many other towns, even nearby, um, this town was really part of a vast land grant from the King of Spain, which was a Baca float. And then at one point, the indigenous people who lived there decided they would sell the land that they believed they owned to the governor of Mexico. And thereby creating one of the first land scams in Arizona's history. Because, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we were fraught with Arizona, with people reselling land multiple times and all kinds of fun things like that. So, but Rio Rico is really kind of right in the middle of all so much. You've got Tucum Cori, which is what I think San Javier del Bach must have looked like when they first discovered it. And you can get a chance to go through and see all that age and well-worn beauty. And that is, some would say, patina. You can also, because it's in some of the most beautiful landscape in all of Southern Arizona, I mean, you've got Aravaca right there. You've got Patagonia. You've got wine country. You've got so much right in that area. And so they do have a golf club down there. But what's unique about this is that it's also designated as an Audubon Cooperative Sanctuary, which is dedicated to birding trails and areas. Because that whole area of Southern Arizona has so much birding that you can do tours and take a look at all kinds of birds that you may not see elsewhere. It also has Patagonia Lake State Park, which became a park in the mid-70s. And it's about 250 acres of greenery, water, and other beauty you can go take a look at. Now, I think when you take a really look at Rio Rico, you can really see it is right in the middle of Patagonia, Tubac, Aravaca, Amados, and right in the middle of so much history. And I mean, just miles away from Mexico. So it's such a great location. So go enjoy some cooler temperatures when you go to visit Rio Rico. Now with Arizona History Happy Hour, you know, I like to say every week we have a special guest. And, you know, every week here on Arizona History Happy Hour, we always have a special guest on. And I am so excited to bring on a really good friend. So happy that you can be here. Let's see. It's nice to see you, Marshall. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. And how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And for those that don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. You bet. Um, my name is Anne LeCure. I am the executive director of the Arizona Commission on the Arts. I grew up uh, here in the Valley near Phoenix College. I went to school in Scottsdale and then up to Northern Arizona University. I'm a proud lumberjack spent most of my career working in DC and now um, really pleased to be home and working at the commission. Indeed. And so happy you're here. And so now we've got a little bit of trivia that we're going to go through. And so now we do trivia a little different than if you're used to just standard bar trivia. So what we'll do is we'll go through the questions and the multiple choice answers. Okay. 
And now you, people can keep track of this wherever they want. I mean, if they would like to do this on their arm and a magic marker, they're welcome to do that. Some folks keep track of their answers in the chat session. Whatever makes you feel, feel comfortable, you go right ahead and do just that. All right. So let's go ahead and launch into question one, which is what year was the Arizona Commission on the Arts established? Was it A, 1967? B, 1912, C, 1948, or D, 1990. So what year do you think the Arizona Commission on the Arts was established? All right, question two. The same year the Arizona Commission on the Arts was established, another Arizona arts institution made its debut in the basement of a Tucson hotel. What was it? Was it A, Arizona Theater Company, B, Phoenix Symphony, C, Arizona Opera, or D, Ballet Arizona? So what do you think made its debut the very same year that Arizona Commission on the Arts made its debut as well? All right, question three. Anne is only the seventh person to hold the position of executive director at the Arizona Commission on the Arts. The longest serving executive director was Shelly Cohen. How long did Shelly serve as executive director? Was it A, eight years, B, 12 years, C, 17 years, or D, 21 years? So how long do you think Shelly was the executive director of the Commission on the Arts? Now, not active in the community because that's still going on, but... So, and I'm sure there'll be more about that later on. All right. So question four. Approximately how many nonprofit arts organizations receive grants from the Arizona Commission on the Arts each year? Is it A, 20 to 25, B, 50 to 75, C, 100 to 125, or D, 200 to 100 and 200? to 250. Wow. All right. So while you're trying to figure that out, we're getting to that halfway point. And question five. In the early 70s, the Arizona Commission on the Arts provided funding to support a groundbreaking program led by poet and creative writing professor Richard Shelton. What was unusual about this program? Included multiple languages. Answer A. Or B conducted in the Arizona State Prison System, C, delivered via phone booth, or D, painted as murals. So what do you think was unique about that early 70s program? All right, question six. Which future National Book Award winner, author, was contracted by the Arizona Commission in 1984 to tour the state and provide writing workshops? Was it A, Cormac McCarthy, B, Dennis Johnson, C, Alice Walker, or D, Don DeLillo? So who do you think was the National Book Award winner but had been contracted earlier to travel the state doing workshops? All right, question seven. The Commission on the Arts continues to provide grants to Arizona artists. Which of these is not a project proposed by a recent grantee? A, a mobile puppet show in an ice cream truck. B, an Afro-Indigenous science fiction graphic novel. C, a performance of break, hip-hop, and cumbia. D, poems addressed to a Belgian telescope in a Chilean observatory and aimed at a distant red dwarf. All right, so which of those do you think was not a project proposed? All right, question eight. Since 2014, the Arizona Mission on the Arts has been engaged in building the arts sector capacity to serve one of the state's fastest growing demographics, older adults. What is this field of work generally known as? A, artful aging. B, artisan to the oldies. C, creative aging. Or D, elderly expressions. All right, moving on to question nine. 
true or false, folk and traditional arts such as those practiced by members of the 22 sovereign tribal nations currently residing in Arizona borders are not part of the Arizona mission mission. All right. So do you think that is true or false? All right. And coming up on our last question, question 10, Be beyond the Arizona mission on the arts, the state's art ecosystem is supported by local arts agencies operating as either private nonprofits over units of local or tribal government. How many Arizona communities have their own local arts agency? Is that A, fewer than five, B, six to 10, C, 11 to 20, or D, more than 20? All right. Well, you're trying to figure all those answers out and locking in your final answers. We're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break. And with that, we are going to talk about something that probably everyone sees sitting at a coffee shop nearby when they go. Um, but we're going to talk about Michael Lacey, who has been inducted into the Arizona Music Hall of Fame. Now, Michael moved to Tempe back in 1966 to attend ASU. Now, while he was a student, he realized that he found writing to be more meaningful and an alternative to drinking. And writing was a way for him to make sense of the politics and share with others appreciation of music. And since that first issue rolled off the presses back in 1970, the New Times has been covering Arizona arts and music community since then. So I always look forward to kind of their, what should I be doing on a first Friday? What are the concerts I should be checking out? So, you know, thank you, Michael, for all you do. And thank you, Phoenix New Times. All right. So now who is ready for some answers? Now, you know, this is where all the magic really happens. So, all right. So, what year was the Arizona Commission on the Arts established? And it is A, 1967. Marshall, I've got a good trivia piece for you. In 1967, uh, Governor Jack Williams signed a bill. Uh, it was Senate Bill 139 on March 13, 1967. A year before that, Governor Sam Goddard established the agency by executive order. That happened on January 24th, 1966. So it was the 28th legislature, uh, 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 Arizona legislature, that established our commission. And uh, it's been about 55 years. Wow. That's a long time supporting the arts in Arizona. Yeah. All right. Question two. The same year the Arizona Commission on the Arts was established, another Arizona arts institution made its debut in the basement of a Tucson hotel. And it was a, the Arizona theater company. Yeah. And they were known as the Arizona civic theater at that time, it was uh, the Santa Rita Hotel. In 1966, they staged their first production in the basement. Wow. Now, yeah. uh, now ATC splits their operations between Phoenix and Tucson. Of course, they produce world-class theater. They do, and I just went to see the last show of the, of the season um, last Did week. You? Yeah, really good. So if folks down in Tucson get a chance, I think there's still a chance to go see it down there. So run, get your tickets and go. See, I think it's making of an American son. <gasps> Fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so it's go a see new, it. It's a new work. And so, so well done. Yeah. I saw justice. Ah, uh, that's great. Yeah, and so looking, they haven't announced their next season yet, but, uh, you know, that's always kind of fun to wait until the end of summer when people start rolling out their new seasons. So that will be exciting. 
All right. So Anne is only the seventh person to hold the position of executive director for the Arizona Commission on the Arts. The longest serving ED was Shelly Cohen. And how long did Shelly serve? And it is D21 years. Well, that's how long she served at the commission. But you know, Shelly. And uh, she's, she's always out there making things happen. She's on the board of the Desert Botanical Garden, uh, the Child's Play Theater, and the Arizona Community Foundation. And uh, boy, we appreciate her service every day. Shelly is... Um, a true Arizona original. Indeed. And she's out there. I mean, I know still hitting the pavement, doing great work for those organizations. So. All right. So approximately how many nonprofit arts organizations receive grants from the Arizona Commission on the Arts each year? And the correct answer is D 200 to 250. And I'm sure That's you're going to talk right. about each. Are you sure you're going to talk about each one of those? Sure, we have all day, don't we? Exactly. Um, about so, our largest grant making program supports operating support. Um, and that's about 225 nonprofit arts organizations throughout the state, um, plus uh, individual artists and then other groups that are doing projects. So uh, we're very um, proud and uh, work hard to try to be consistent with that service. And what I love is it's, it really is across the state. It's not just central Arizona or southern Arizona or northern Arizona, but really it truly is a wide organization. That's right. It's, um, there's a group of young people on the Tohono O'odham uh, Nation, a professional ballet company in Yuma, uh, an incredible aerial dance troupe in Flagstaff. Uh, really, every corner of the state has something to get involved in. Indeed. All right, question five. In the early 70s, the Arizona Commission on the Arts provided funding to support a groundbreaking program led by poet and creative writing professor Richard Shelton. Now, what was unusual about the program is that it took place in the Arizona State Prisons. Oh, my yeah. gosh. This is a great story. In 1970, uh, Richard Shelton was a poet and U of A creative writing professor, and he received a letter from a man on death row asking for feedback on his poetry. Um, that letter ultimately led to a decades long work teaching creative writing in the Arizona state prison system. Uh, the workshops are still taught today and a number of the program's graduates would go on to become published poets, um, including Jimmy Santiago Baca, Michael Hogan, and Ken Lamberton. Wow. Yeah. And I love the fact that it's still happening today. It is. And writing is one of those most personal art forms. Everyone has a chance to operate a journal, mm -hmm. you know, so even in places as, um, you know, sort of uh, formal and um, structured as a prison setting, you know, uh, you can cre keep your creative thoughts anywhere. Right. And we all have those thoughts. Yeah. All right. Question six. Which future National Book Award winning author was contracted by the Arizona Commission on the Arts back in 1984 to tour the state and providing writing workshops? And it was B. Dennis Johnson. That is exactly right. Um, Dennis was dispatched to be a traveling teaching artist um, with support from the commission and uh, taught creative writing workshops in particularly small and rural communities all over the state. Wow. That's great. People had access to a world-class author before, I mean, before he, he became world-class. 
Yeah, folks might remember in 1992, there was a short story collection, um, Jesus' Son, that um, kind of uh, led to his acclaim. All right. So question seven, the Arizona Commission on the Arts continues to provide grants to Arizona artists. Now, which one of these is not a project proposed? Well, you know, nobody here should be shocked that we are have some trick questions. And so what I love is that all of those have been proposed as projects. And so, Anne, please tell us about some of these amazing folks. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Um, these come from our research and development grant. And as you might expect, um, that's a place where artists can explore um, ideas that are in some stage of development. So right now, uh, our awards go to about 20 to 30 artists who are really working on the edge of their um, area of work, the edge of their art form. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I love the fact that, I mean, just look at that graphic novel. I mean, as graphic novels keep getting hotter and hotter, it's great that, we now have things like this for people to put on the shelves. You know what I think is the coolest thing I've seen in my career is artists have become deeply multidisciplinary. And we have a lot of creative tools on our phones, for example. Um, of course, the you know, creativity is a birthright. Each one of us have it, but some folks do work professionally and they need that support early on. Uh, to explore some places um, that maybe is beyond the work that they're doing today. And, you know, and I can't sing um, praise enough for puppet pie. I mean, <laughs> that ice cream truck is so amazing to see it Puppets roll down the street. Cream. Of course. So, I mean, of course I'm a little biased since she did make my little mini me, my bartender, silent Bob. Mm -hmm. Oh, Okay. So, yeah, so actually, so, yeah, so everybody gets to see some of Stacey's work every week. So. All right. Since 2014, the Arizona Mission on the Arts has been engaging in building the arts sector capacity to serve one of the state's fastest growing demographics, older adults. What is that field of study generally known as? See creative aging. Yep. And here's the truth. Uh, I, we're all aging. I hate to say it. Arizona has an incredibly vibrant uh, senior uh, community, communities. And so this work could not be more important to us. I'll just share personally. Um, I uh, live with my father who is enjoying his uh uh, later days in his life. Uh, we do all kinds of things together, art, de outdoor gardening. Um, it, we like to cook together. And there's just so much that is available in our days through creative practice. And I really want to, I do it myself and I want to encourage everybody to just get involved in your own creative life. And there's so many ways to do that now. I mean, there's so many different um, organizations or even places that do i mean i know like joe bot was doing for a while they're doing free drawing classes That's i had to right. just walk in and so and so and i love that it's not just things you have to pay to like say paint some pottery or something else but there's a whole gambit of things that you can enjoy enjoy that's right just to it. ask just ask yourself what you might get curious about or what would serve your life you know fill your life full of joy maybe you need to move your body or write down some words or sing some songs. It's all available to us. So right. Or go to a, a or go to a first Friday or a third Friday or hang out with Nancy over at Hazel and Violet and let her press some things. I mean, there's so many ways to get engaged. Um, That's right. Know, and, and move it or lose it folks. Let's, you know, yeah, and I know I was just I was just talking to a friend and he was he was at an event and he noticed this guy kind of like hanging out in the corner and just started chatting with him. 
And so they developed this friendship. And so it's so great because the guy was like, you know, it's like I'm here by myself. I don't really know anybody, but everybody was so warm and welcoming. And so, yeah. And I just love that about us. Really, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like we're, we're all kind of just trying to make the world a little bit better place. And you know what? Being welcoming is an active pursuit. We've got to really do it every day. And I'm, I admire our arts and cultural institutions so much for the ways that they get that done. We have a lot of new people coming uh, either to live here now or always to visit. And so being a welcoming community just couldn't be more important. Right. And just saying hello. And you never know where where that next story is going to come from. I mean, that's kind of the fun of it. That's right. Whatever age you are. Exactly. All right. Question nine. True or false? Folk and traditional arts such as practiced by the members of the 22 sovereign tribal nations currently residing within Arizona's borders are not part of the Arizona Commission's mission. That well, that's a, false. <laughs> that's a trick question, too. Indeed. Um, of, of course they are. And, um, and here's a moment to just uh, really pay our respects and gratitude to our ancestors from all the tribal nations, uh, the cultural leaders who have brought us here today, um, the uh, contemporary artists and people living in community on tribal lands, and then all of the leadership uh, that is afforded to us today through our relationships with tribal communities. Um, it's just part and parcel with everything we are here and uh, every chance to do something uh, that lifts up that history um, and, and pays due respect is we're about that. Yeah, I mean, I was just at the Herd Museum, um, I think it was last month. Not at the Herd, it was their Phoenix Art Museum. They've got the exhibit up right now. And so they've got a bunch of Douglas Miles skateboards on the so wall. So cool. And which is such a, I mean, oh my gosh. And um, and then there was a performance by Tony Duncan um, playing flute in front of that, which was just incredible. Yeah. Skate culture is so cool. And I'm so glad that we got that opportunity to have that dialogue with the piece in the Phoenix Art Museum. And of course, you know, um, big ups to our Herd Museum uh, for decades. 1932, isn't it? That the yeah. Herd, 32 or 33, Herd was established and, and we've benefited from that every day since. Well, and they've been doing some really amazing stuff of really kind of also highlighting not just traditional arts, but now looking at some of those upcoming artists that are kind of playing with those traditional mediums and themes in different ways. That's right. And we've got a great program um, that's called the Master Apprenticeship Program. And it is a way for all of our culture bearers in the state to transmit their know-how, their knowledge, you know, all the elements of their art form, most of that you learn side by side in the studio. And so we're really proud to have uh, 48 alumni of that program over oh, the wow. years and a new round of grants uh, coming out soon um, because that it's a really important way to transmit our cultural heritage. Which is so important because we live in such a cultural place. So many, so many people view, I think, Arizona as kind of, we're not one of the coasts. So we're like this culture wasteland. But, you know, it's like, but that is so not the Who case. Who could possibly believe that, right? I, uh, You know, once you get here, you realize that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So question 10. Beyond the Arizona Commission on the Arts, the state's arts ecosystem is supported by local arts agencies operating as either in private nonprofits over units of local or tribal government? How many Arizona communities have their own local arts agencies? And it is D, more than 20. That's right. Um, you know, in the arts, we're often known for our capacity to surprise and delight. We're often the folks behind the curtain 
setting up the event, getting things going. And um, uh, local arts councils are very much the way that all of that gets done. Uh, they provide a kind of infrastructure and a network for the arts community, the creative community in every place in Arizona, neighborhood or city level. We have big local arts agencies like the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, um, but then also Patagonia Creative Arts Association. They're getting the work done in Patagonia and that region. And that's the most important thing. Art is what happens for people in the room. You know, you got to be there. You got to show up and participate um, in order to get all those benefits and all the fun and joy that comes from it. Right. And it's also, I mean, when it's like, I also love that so many of those organizations are moving into old buildings. So it's like, I mean, you've got Globe, you've got all these different cities across Arizona where they're repurposing old high schools, old buildings. And so it's a way to also keep the arts alive, but also that history, those communities. Really Heritage preservation. Life. Yes. Yes. And that's why I appreciate your work so much, Marshall, because you mentioned earlier, some folks don't know much about the place they're coming to visit or that they've moved to. And so um, as much as we can roll out the welcome wagon, as much as we can share the history, it's a very complicated uh, page turner history here in Arizona, but from so many different perspectives, I just really hope we keep sharing that um, with ourselves and then with everybody who comes to visit and, and comes to stay here. Yeah, because I mean, there's so many amazing communities throughout Arizona, whether it's that small town of 50 people or whether it's a megapolitan city like Phoenix. That's right. I enjoyed a visit to Wickenburg, you know, oh, uh, recently nice. and I'm headed to Sholo soon. Um, yeah, there's a good spot. And that's another thing is... Um, Every spot in Arizona offers this very unique creative experience, especially for our visitors. They may fly in through Phoenix or Tucson or some of the other regional airports, but almost everybody is here to get some kind of unique Arizona experience. And that's really what we offer. For some people, it may be the only time they visit in their lifetime. So we really try to... Um, roll out the carpet for our friends and neighbors. Right. And, you know, and just get out there and explore because that's half the fun of poking your head into a little gallery or community arts source. Um, oh my gosh. And there's also Sherry with um, just the Arizona, what is it? The Arizona, um, the artist resource center. Oh my gosh. If people are yes. looking for resources, I mean, she's got an amazing collection of stuff. That's right. And um, you bring up Sherry, and that reminds me also, we should mention just a little bit about arts education. Get ready, folks. Um, there's some really neat things that will be happening in schools, uh, especially as we take advantage of some of the, um, they're not emergency resources, they're other kinds of federal resources that come through the Department of Education. And uh, Really, parents look out for new opportunities for young people. We really need our youth, our creative youth, to um, get their shot and provide their leadership. So uh, that should be coming soon. See, that's one of the things I always love, like going to the state fair and seeing all the youth art that's up on the walls and just the talent that's out there in so many ways, whether it's writing, drawing, whatever, just that, it, that, that emotional release. That's right. And also we have a, a long tradition in American culture of youth leaders uh, giving us vision for where we're going as a society, uh, as a democracy. I think they have a lot to tell us right now. And so um, our youth programs really focus on young people in community as they rise uh, to provide their voice and their vision for who will become. 
Indeed. Now, as, as I always like to, as we, as we kind of just wind down from trivia, I always like to ask, how did you do? And, you know, I always like to say it's not how well you did, but look at the stories, the resources, the opportunities to get engaged in a variety of communities across the state that we've talked about. And so I know people will be putting some of their scores in the chat. Um, and I always love that, but it really is more about the stories and just, I mean, and just checking things out and enjoying. Now, I know you had mentioned that there are some grant opportunities coming up. If people wanted to find those, they can go here to the website, Peter's Mission on the Arts, and find out when those deadlines are, requirements, how to apply. That's right. Uh, and there, if I might say so, there is a very special um, box on our website, a uh, little greeting from me. I really want to hear creative stories from Arizona. So if you want to share a video or a picture and, or, or a little note, um, it really is so important for me to understand how uh, creative life feels on in your home or in your block or with the group that you work with. And so, yes, we do have those grant opportunities. I really invite each and every one to think about if that might be an opportunity for you. Even still, just, you know, log on to the website and tell me a story about creative life uh, in your world. I really would love to hear it. See, and I, and I agree. I think, I think I love hearing from people. I love hearing their perspectives, um, their stories. So I completely agree with you. So I will flash that again. So in case anybody wants to click on that box and send you a little video or maybe a story about how they've been creative or engaged. So, all right. So, and I want to say thanks so much for coming on and telling us about Arizona Mission on the Arts. Because I know you do, you do a lot of work, but you're kind of one of those, it's like the organization is not necessarily up front saying, here's what we're doing. But so many artists benefit and so many communities benefit from the work that you all do. That's right. That's right. We feel very humbled um, to do this, you know, job uh, on behalf of the creative community. And we're grateful uh, to all of our elected officials, our arts advocates, our stakeholders, um, who would uh, received a generous uh, legislative appropriation this year. And so really uh, want to get to work on behalf of the creative community. Very good. Well, thank you so much for being here and have a great rest of your night. Let's see. And then. All right. Well, you know, I want to say again, thank you, Anne, so much for being on and just sharing some of how people can get engaged, um, how creatives can maybe find other sources. So again, thank you so much for coming on. And so as we're getting ready for From the Vault, you know, I mentioned it was DeGrazia's birthday. And so that's where we're going to actually take ourselves is into his museum a little bit. So, you know, he's got a space down in Tucson. Now, oh, so, you know, so De Grazia was the son of Italian immigrants. He was born on July 14th, 1909 in the Marinci Mining Camp of Territorial Arizona. And that helped him kind of develop this lifelong appreciation for the native cultures in the desert. Now, the mine closed, as we all know. Um, his entire, him as a youth and his entire family moved back to Italy. When the mines reopened, they actually moved back now, he also was well known as a trumpeter and would travel around playing his music. And he decided to, at one point, hop a ride to Tucson 
with a little bit of cash in his pocket and his trumpet, and he enrolled at U of A and had his own band. And during one of his performances, he met Alexandra, who was the daughter of Fox Theater owner. And they wound up getting married and moving, moving to Bisbee, where he painted. He also got promoted by Arizona Highways. They started publishing features on his art. And then he had the opportunity when he was on a vacation in Mexico City to work with Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco. So after coming back to Tucson, he found that no gallery was really interested in his exhibiting his artwork. And he, at that point, he had met his next wife, who had been a, a sculptor from New York. And they bought 10 acres. He built a little gallery. And that is what became Gallery in the Sun where you can go see a space that was built by Ted Grazi's own hands, the gallery in the sun, as well as some of many pieces of his original artwork. We, you know, we've all seen the variety of gosh, you know, again, people call him Arizona's Warhol because his art was so reproduced in terms of, I mean, I've seen glasses, bells, Christmas cards, so much with his artwork on it. And you can get a chance to see the world a little bit more through his lenses at the Gallery in the Sun. And it's right down in Tucson. Here's a little map to show you kind of how to get there. So look it up. It's well worth a visit. Now you'll see why, I mean, from learning about Ted DeGrazia to... Arizona Mission on the Arts, why I always suggest you click on that little share box so that way we can share more and more of those stories about Arizona history and our arts and culture and stop people thinking that we're a wasteland right here. Now, next week, I'm excited because it is Cindy Gentry. Now, she is the woman who basically founded the Phoenix Public Market which has grown by leaps and bounds since those early days. And so we're going to talk about the history of how that formed. So really looking forward to that and getting a chance to talk to Cindy again. So I will see you right here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And remember, I always love to hear from you all. So if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, if you didn't get them in the chat, please send them to me via email. Now, as we get ready to say good night, I always love to give a shout out to Chris and Cole, who made that great video at the beginning, as well as PJ my cocktail advisor. And we are going to say good evening with Keith Herring, who was painting right here in Arizona in 1986. He did a mural downtown, which we've now lost. That's a whole other story. But we're going to close out with him and about 60 students from South Mountain. Hi, painting a mural in downtown Phoenix. Good night, all.